What up, party people? Matt Lehman, the owner of SpatulaCityRecords.com for all of your vinyl record needs. So today, if you're interested, uh, I will give you a little information on Folkways Records. Uh, this is Folkways Records. If you're not familiar with them, this is, they almost always look like this. They're black and white covers. Uh, they usually have white or brown lettering on the bottom. It's always folk music, ethno music, world music, poetry, kids music, and stuff like that. Um, the reason I want to kind of talk about this is it's, it's a pretty interesting story it is a pretty amazing uh, record label quite honestly and I, it, I know I haven't done a lot of videos and I apologize for that it's taken me a long time to kind of figure out where I wanted to go with this channel I, I started to do the cleaning stuff but I kind of ran out of that and I, I didn't want it to go down the channel of hey look at this really expensive record that I have you should look for it uh, I like that because you get the information but it's not really who I am or what I'm about um, and I kind of just realized I want to talk about what what I like and, and if or what I at least find interesting and usually backstories are what I find interesting um, so if you like them great if not you can move along check out the next one and see what happens but so anyway this if you listen in the background this is this is this record this is Amazing Grace uh, by Wayfaring Stranger um, so this record company or this record label was started in 1948 by Moses Ash that's A S C H he was actually born in 1905 in uh, I want to say Yugoslavia but I think Czech Republic or or something like that but they moved to the United States to get away from oppression uh, in 1926 he opened a radio repair shop but he always wanted to be a sound engineer so in 1938 he uh, opened or started founded Ash Records You'll see a lot of those, we won't see a lot of them, but you'll, if you see them, they're usually 78s. Um, and there's, they're, they're mostly, uh, God, I think it's Czech, Czechoslovakian. Um, I'll have to get, I'll have to write that in the notes to see where it's from, I can't remember exactly. Uh, but he ended up going bankrupt in 48 because he overextended the company, uh, which sucks. But in four, the same year, 1948, he actually started Folkways Records, um, which he got the name from his uh, editor at the time. He came up with the name. But the the beauty of it is, is he couldn't get the couldn't start the company in his name because he was already overextended on his first company. So he actually put it under his secretary's name, Marion Distiller or Dis Distiller, and she was the CEO for the company from 1948 all the way up to 86. He was actually just a consultant for the company, but he was the consultant for the entire time, and he, he basically ran the company as a consultant. Uh, he did, so his, his background is, he said he read a, a book called uh, Cowboy Songs by John Lomax, and it spoke to him, and he kind of realized that or came up with the idea that uh, American folklore and uh, that type of music convinced him that that music was the literature of the common people. So he wanted to record as much of this for posterity and for future generations. Um, and in 19, so as he went along, so from 1948 to 1986, which is when the company existed, uh, they recorded 2,168 albums. Um, that is an insane amount of albums for that particular time. We'll get into why that's so insane in just a minute, but uh, one of the good stories from this is in 1952, he hired, I had never heard of this word before, an ethnomusicologist, Harry Smith, out of San Francisco, to kind of give him an anthology of all this folk music. And Harry Smith sent him all of his recordings uh, on COD. And if you don't know what COD is, it's credit on delivery. That means if I send you something COD, you have to pay for it when, when it comes to you in order for you to accept the package. And Moses was known to be a thrifty man and he, he scoffed at it for days and days and days and Harry finally got him to accept the COD because it was several hundred dollars because I mean it was boxes and boxes of stuff. but. And at the time, in 1952, he has a ton of money. Uh, he's, he later went, uh, Moses later said it was probably the most important collection he'd ever recorded and that will probably ever be recorded for folk music. Um, but so he wanted to record and collect all of this music from different ethnicities, from different walks of life. And the reason that this is this is insanely important and, and interesting is, is you have to look at the time frame. You're talking 1948 to 1986. Well, 1948, 
the only way they could go around and record this music, like these are, if, if you look at this, if you look, this came, actually this came with a booklet, which is pretty cool. I've never seen one with a booklet and photos. It has all the lyrics, but it also has pictures of like where they went to get this music, just these random people on the, on the roads. Uh, some of these are known folk artists like Roscoe Holcomb, um, but so in order to, to, to record this music, they weren't just going after the Woody Guthrie's and stuff like that. They, they literally sent people in cars all over the world, all over the United States, especially down south, to find these people. And they would just drive down into a gas station and say, hey, you know anybody that plays music around here? And then they'd say, yeah, sure, uh, Joe Bob down the street, uh, take three, court, three, three miles down the street, take a left at the broken tree, take a right, and then stop and ask another guy and he'll tell you where it is. And so they would sit around and search for these guys a lot of times they would literally record them right then and there and then they would take them back and record these records so the amount of effort that went in that that went into make these is just insane and they literally created these or brought these styles of music into the world uh, hawaiiana or hawaiian music is a great example of that that wasn't brought to the united states until the 40s i believe and, and nobody really knew about it because where would you hear about it you didn't hear about it on the radio because you didn't get radio stations that would play it so it's 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 diverse and just amazing and i don't necessarily love every one of these records that comes through here but just the, the history that comes in with them um, every time one comes through i always listen to it and check it out um, if you get a chance to listen to that folk music it's it's pretty the uh, anthology, it's its pretty deep. I mean, there, I think there's 20 records in it or 30 records in it. Um, but this, but Moses Ash founded, basically founded the career of Pete Seeger, Woody Guthrie, Arlo Guthrie, Lead Belly, uh, Ella Jenkins, Cisco Hampton, or, or Cisco Houston. Um, a lot of those names you may or may not know, but I guarantee you the artists that you listen to know who those are. Like Bob Dylan gives uh, Ash a lot of credit, so does Bruce Springsteen, um, for, for bringing the genre. Uh, what was it? So Folkway also created the Broadside label, um, that was in the 60s. They did it to document the radical underground publication of the same name. It was called, uh, Broadside, or no, what was it? Uh, I think it was just a radical underground publication. Uh, and the Broadside Ballads had an album that had Phil Oaks. It also had uh, Pete Seeger and Dylan, although Dylan recorded under the pseudonym of Blind Boy Grunt. So uh, I don't know if you knew that or not. I did not know that. I don't know why he did that. I assume he didn't want to be, uh, he wouldn't not wanted to be affiliated with the underground publication, but uh, he might've just done it just to, just to keep it on the, on the down low, I guess. Uh, Ash was a big, big proponent of not going with big names, which is why he never really recorded a whole lot with Dylan or anybody else, because he didn't want that, he didn't want his label to become known as a, as a seeker of, of stars or, or stuff like that. He wanted the, he wanted the authenticity of the, uh, of the artists and the style of music at the time. Um, interesting thing when, when, so, Sorry, so uh, Folkways became um, Smithsonian Folkways in 86 or 88. They, they bought it, uh, 87 Smithsonian purchased it. But before he passed, he made sure that before the Smithsonian could buy his catalog, he had, they had to agree that they would never remove anything from the catalog. Meaning, you can go to the Smithsonian Folkways website and every one of those 2,168 recordings is available for purchase. Um, either on MP3 or I think they have CDs. They don't have them all. Obviously, they don't have records available right now. They may they may start repressing them. Who knows? Um, but it, it's pretty amazing that that's that's how much how much passion he had for it and how much he, he wanted this to, to last forever. His his quote was, "Just because the letter J isn't the most used letter in the alphabet doesn't mean we should take it out of the alphabet." And that's how he felt about his music. Just because you may not like this mountain music of Kentucky doesn't mean it should shouldn't exist. Um, and I think that's pretty indicative of what's going on in the world right now. Um, so that's about it. Um, it's, it's cool stuff. Oh, actually I take that back. Uh, in 1964, which would have been halfway through their career, they started in 1948. Uh, in 1964, he actually helped Verve start Verve Folkway. 
uh, and then Verve Folkway became Verve Forecast. So you may not know Verve Folkway, you probably do if you've collected records for a while, but you certainly know Verve Forecast, everything's on that. Um, but that's it. I mean, it, they all, like, they, after his passing, they all of those big dogs came out and said we wouldn't be who we are with, without these recordings. It's just, it's just the sheer amount of, of work that went into making these recordings and traveling around. Like, you got to understand, in the 40s and 50s, you're still, most of these people didn't have TVs. A lot of these people didn't even have electricity, so they didn't know what was going on. Just some white dude cruising in in a car asking to record your music. And it's, it's far fetched for both sides, you know. It was a it was a pretty rough time to be cruising around the streets of southern Mississippi, uh, and all over the world too. Like I said, they went into all through Africa and and everywhere in the world that they could get music, uh, Russia and everything. So it, it was it's it's an immense undertaking. It would be an immense undertaking for today, let alone eighty years ago. But that's it. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. I'm going to keep doing this for a while. We'll see. I, I definitely have a couple other labels I want to do. I might try to go through a bunch of them. But uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Once again, this is, I'm Matt Lehman, the owner of SpatulaCityRecords.com. Please uh, hit the like button. Give it a thumbs up. And uh, tell your friends. And please follow us on Instagram. I give all sorts of interesting records and stuff. I got a lot of things coming down the pike. I think it's kind of interesting. I'm trying to spice up my Instagram. But uh, as always, buy nine records, get one free. Free shipping on orders of $50 or more and all of our records are ultrasonically cleaned. Later!